In this lecture, we will learn about the structure of the cartilage. Cartilage is basically a connective tissue. It is a flexible structure. However, it is firm. If you want to feel what the cartilage feels like, then you can touch the tip of your nose or your ear, and then you can feel the feel the structure of the cartilage. It is of course strong and it is also has the ability to absorb shock. It has a cushioning effect. Just like any tissue and specifically like connective tissue, cartilage has three components. Those are the ground substance, the specialized cells and the fiber component. Now here you have a slide where you can see all three components. So this blue area is the ground substance, white areas are the cells, and this red area where there are lines like, that is the fibers. Now let's talk about each component separately. Firstly, we'll talk about the ground substance. In cartilage, there are large amounts of ground substance. And this ground substance is made out of proteoglycans, mainly glycosoaminoglycans. And the chemical name for this is chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate. You will learn their chemical structure in biochemistry. Now these molecules, they have the ability to absorb water and give the cartilage its shock absorbing properties. Now this is a picture showing you those molecules. You can see that they have many chains. And between these chains, water molecules get trapped and that gives the cartilage the ability to withstand shock. Now let us learn about the cells of a cartilage. There are two types chondroblasts, which are called cartilage precursor cells, and chondrocytes, which are the mature cartilage cells. Two types, chondroblasts and chondrocytes. Let's learn about the chondroblasts in a little bit of detail. As I said, they are cartilage precursor cells. They originate from the primitive mesenchymal cells and they undergo several mitotic divisions. And this division gives rise to aggregations of cells. So you see groups of cells, either two or four. And these chondroblasts, they have the ability to synthesize the ground substance and the fibers. So the chondroblasts are the cells that give rise to the ground substance as well as the fibers that form the cartilage. Chondroblasts secrete the ground substance or another name for it is matrix or matrix proteins and these cells become trapped within this matrix. The cells are separated from each other by the matrix. The cells, as I said before, undergo one or two mitotic divisions. And because of that, you can see cell clusters or groups of two or four cells. Chondroblasts later mature into chondrocytes. Now let us look at the structure of chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are mature chondroblasts. They have the ability to secrete the cartilage matrix just like chondroblasts. 
end, they secrete the ground substance, that is the matrix, as well as the fibers. The chondrocytes maintain the turnover of the matrix, that is, they manage the matrix. Whatever is lacking, they will produce, and if it is not necessary, it will get degraded. Chondrocytes don't usually undergo division, but if it is necessary, they can undergo division as well. Now here is a histological section of a cartilage showing you chondroblasts and chondrocytes. Now these, this is the periphery of the cartilage and on the periphery you can see single or double cells. These are the chondroblasts. Then as you come to the deeper layers of the cartilage, you can see groups of cells, two, or four. Sometimes because when you section, you may not be able to catch all four cells. So it appears as if there are three cells, but that just means that you haven't caught the fourth cell in your section, okay? So chondrocytes appear in groups of two or four. Now here you can very clearly see the cartilage cells with their prominent nuclei. And you can see the matrix, which is uh, this purplish color. So you see single peripheral chondroblasts and the deeper layers you see chondrocytes groups of two or four. Now looking at higher magnification of a cartilage tissue, you can see that these are the cartilage cells where you see the cytoplasm in white and the nucleus in dark purple. These cartilage cells are inside what are called lacunae. These are the lacunae. There are small cytoplasmic extensions starting from one chondrocyte moving on to the other. As you see, there are no blood vessels in the cartilage matrix. Because of that, the cells have to be nourished through diffusion. These small cytoplasmic extensions connect each of the cells together. Therefore, exchange of material between the cytoplasm of cells and the matrix, which is shown in purple, stained in purple, happens. And on the periphery, you have connective tissue, and there you will find blood vessels. Now let us look at the ultrastructure of a chondrocyte. This is the electron micrograph of chondrocyte. Here you can see the cytoplasmic extensions. They may be difficult to see in light microscopy, but these extensions are visible in electron micrography. You can see the large nucleus with euchromatin, lots of open chromatin. You can see the prominent rough endoplasmic reticulum and the well-developed Golgi apparatus. All these things are there because this is a cell which produces protein, namely the matrix proteins of the cartilage. Now here you can see loops of cartilage as well as the matrix. This is a HNA &E section of the tracheal cartilage. These are called isogenous groups and these are, this is the purple areas is the matrix. Now you can look at the matrix, but it seems that there are no, not much features here. So we call this amorphous matrix. The cartilage cells can be visualized clearly and these isogenous groups are there. And then the matrix is divided into territorial matrix. That is the matrix immediately surrounding the chondrocytes or chondroblasts and the interterritorial matrix, which is, which is the matrix that separates the cells. Now let us look at the structure of the perichondrium. Cartilage is surrounded by the perichondrium. 
perichondrium has collagen fibers and fibroblasts. These fibroblasts can transform into chondroblasts and form new cartilage at the periphery, just underneath the perichondrium. When you say peri, means periphery, okay? So chondrium means cartilage. So perichondrium is the tissue that covers the cartilage in the periphery. Now the perichondrium contains blood vessels and nerve fibers. Nourishment of the cartilage is maintained by the blood vessels in the perichondrium. Metabolites have to reach cartilage cells by diffusion across the matrix. Because of this, the thickness of the cartilage is limited because there's always a limit to diffusion. If you have extremely thick cartilage, then metabolites cannot diffuse into the center. So this prevents the cartilage from growing very thick. Here is the same picture we saw earlier. So this is the perichondrium where you can see the collagen fibers and the fibroblasts, right? So blood vessels are not visible here, but you get blood vessels here. And from those blood vessels, you get metabolites diffusing into the matrix and then into the cells and maybe through the cytoplasmic extensions or the interterritorial matrix, all these cartilage cells have to be nourished through diffusion. So this part is the perichondrium of the cartilage. Now let us look at cartilage growth a little bit. There are two types of cartilage growth, appositional growth, where fibroblasts transform into chondroblasts and they lay down cartilage in the periphery. Then you have interstitial growth, where chondrocytes divide and deposit matrix within the deeper layers of the cartilage. This type of growth is minimal in mature cartilage. Okay, so there are two types of cartilage growth, appositional and interstitial. As I said earlier as well, cartilage matrix does not contain blood vessels. Exchange of metabolites occur through diffusion across the matrix. This limits the thickness of the cartilage. Sometimes, however, Thick masses of cartilage, such as costal cartilages, may have tiny channels which convey blood vessels to the deep layers. However, we maintain the fact that cartilages are bloodless or do not have blood supply. Now let us discuss about the fibers. Cartilage has two different types of fibers that is collagen fibers and elastin fibers. It is the amount and the type of fibers present in the matrix of the cartilage that decides the type of cartilage. According to the amount and type of fibers, we can divide cartilages into three types, hyaline cartilage, fibrous cartilage or fibrocartilage and elastic cartilage. In hyaline cartilage, you have small amounts of collagen fibers. In fibrocartilage or fibrous cartilage, you have large amounts of collagen fibers. In elastic cartilage, you have large amounts of elastic fibers. Now let us look at the structure of hyaline cartilage in detail. Hyaline cartilage is the commonest type of cartilage and it is found in the trachea and the bronchi in the respiratory system, in the costal cartilages of your chest, the articular surfaces of synovial joints, the epiphyseal growth plate, the nasal septum and most of the laryngeal cartilages. All these structures are made out of hyaline cartilage. Now here you can see an HNE section of the trachea showing you 
a hyaline cartilage plate. This is the typical appearance of hyaline cartilage. The matrix has collagen fibers, but these cannot be seen because in light microscopy, the collagen fibers and the matrix have the same refractive power. Refractive power, therefore the matrix appears amorphous. Amorphous means characterless. You can't really see anything. They just appear like a opaque glassy area. And then embedded in this matrix, you can see the cartilage cells. So chondroblasts in the periphery and chondrocytes in the middle single chondroblasts and groups of two or four chondrocytes in the middle. These cells are inside lacunae and you can see the cytoplasm and the prominent nuclei. Now look, let us look at the structure of fibrocartilage. These are strong cartilages and they have lots of collagen fibers in their matrix. They are found in intervertebral discs in your vertebral column, in the pubic symphysis, in the pelvic bone, in combination with dense fibrous connective tissue, in joint capsules, ligaments, and tendons. Now here you see an HNE section of a fibrocartilage. The matrix contains many bundles of thick collagen fibers. They are oriented in the direction of stress. Between these bundles of collagen fibers, you see chondrocytes, which are arranged in columns between the collagen fiber bundles. This is the structure of a fibrocartilage. Next is elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilages are highly flexible. They are found in the epiglottis, external ear and external auditory canal, the Eustachian tube, and some laryngeal cartilages. They have lots of elastic fibers in their matrix. This is a special stain of elastic cartilage. The matrix is full of branching elastic fibers. These elastic fibers give the cartilage its elastic properties. Special stains are necessary to see these elastic fibers. And in this preparation, the fibers are stained in heavy metal, which is silver here, and it appears black. So these are the chondrocytes, these are the chondroblasts, and in between you have these elastin fibers. This is a section of the epiglottis, the special stain to show you elastic cartilage. This is a high power view of the epiglottis, and you can see the branching elastic fibers. And here you see a lacunae where a chondrocyte would be. So these are the fibers. And the light blue areas are the matrix. Now let us talk about a specialized hyaline cartilage called articular cartilage. Articular cartilages are line the ends of long bones. They are wearproof, they are compressible, and they are low in friction. The articular cartilages line the joint surfaces, the ends of long bones. Articular cartilage is not surrounded by perichondrium, and because of this, they have minimal ability to regenerate. Regenerate means divide and produce the same tissue. So if articular cartilage is damaged, it's difficult for it to heal. This is a special stain of articular cartilage of the knee. The pink area shows you the cartilage. 
The pink area is the matrix with the white area, you see the chondrocytes. Then below that, you see that it is tightly adherent and continuing with the underlying bone. The blue areas is the bone with the white areas being the bone marrow. So this articular cartilage is nourished by the bone, which is highly vascular. Now here you see a real articular cartilage of the knee joint. You can see that it has this beautiful porcelain-like appearance, it's a shiny white appearance. Now let us look at the diseases which affect cartilage. One is osteoarthritis and the other is rheumatoid arthritis. Now here you see the cartilage affected by osteoarthritis on this side. Now this is the thickness of the normal cartilage and osteoarthritis causes the cartilage to be destroyed and the thickness to be reduced. So osteoarthritis is a disease of the elderly and it is caused by shearing forces which destroy the articular cartilage because it has minimal ability to regenerate, it's very difficult to treat this condition. Here, you see the normal knee joint articular cartilage, and here you see where the cartilage has been denuded, removed, right, by shear forces, and the bone is exposed. So these areas, the bone is exposed. Very little cartilage is left on this knee. So the bones will grind together and cause severe pain for this patient. So here you see a radiograph. This is the osteoarthritic knee. This is a normal knee. The articular cartilage forms part of this gap between the two bones of the knee. Here you can see the gap is really reduced and there's what is called sclerosis. So this area has osteoarthritis. If this happens to the knee, it's very difficult to treat it. So sometimes you have to do what is called knee arthroplasty or replacement of the knee joint cartilage with a mechanical device. So this damaged cartilage here is slowly cut away and these artificial joint surfaces are inserted. This is called knee arthroplasty. And this reduces, limits the pain the patient is feeling and brings back mobility. Because when there's severe pain, when the cartilage has been denuded, the patient finds it extremely difficult to move. So when the knee is replaced, they can move again and pain is minimal. 